Hi, I'm here today with Dr. Anil Patel, one of the industry invited speakers uh, talking about Thrive. Thank you very much for talking with us today. Um, I was wondering, since the introduction of Thrive, there's been a rapidly increase in the applications for which it's being used for. Where are its major applications currently? So, a really good, a really good question. So, first, thanks very much for uh, to Anska uh, for inviting me back. Uh, that's very nice. So, I had a uh, a really good couple of days at the Airway SIG meeting, which um, w which was an excellent meeting. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, the uh, the Anska program looks looks excellent as well. Uh, so the question the question is where are we where is Thrive being used and what are its applications? So um, uh, we presented some of our early work last year, and in the last year, quite a lot has changed. Um, the uh, 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 its use for difficult airways is uh, uh, continues, and we have a bigger, larger series, and other people are starting to report on that. And it seems to make a difference to um, uh, the, the the stress levels involved with managing difficult airways. So that's a good thing. Um, it's uh, it's there's been quite a lot of publications uh, in uh, uh, on Thrive. Um, there's some uh, publications in on the paediatric. Uh, uh, sphere. So uh, there are uh, some. Uh, there's a randomised control trial in children, uh, showing that it's extending at the apnea time. Um, there's uh, a very nice paper in quite challenging paediatric airways that shows that there's an extension um, uh, 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 and uh, 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 an ability to maintain uh, oxygen level safely. So that's a that's a that's a very good thing. Um, the, its use in uh, its use in adults has, has, has also been published in. Uh, so there's some some papers or some case reports coming out of its use with very challenging airways. There's uh, a very nice series from here in Brisbane uh, that shows in patients who are um, who have really quite challenging airways, who are stridulous and dyspneic. Uh, the, the technique, the high flow nasal oxygen technique, maintaining spontaneous ventilation and allowing procedures to, to be um, performed for quite prolonged periods of time, so 30, 40 minutes, with normalish CO2 levels at the end. That's of course with spontaneously ventilating techniques. But speaking to the, um, and reading the paper, speaking to the authors of that and reading the paper, it's very clear that, that, they're, that they're finding that their ability to maintain spontaneous ventilation in obstructed, uh, critical airways is improved by having high flow nasal oxygen on board and and of course we would expect that because that's what the the uh, the mechanics shows us that, that there's there's better oxygenation and there's reduced dead space and there's uh, uh, a, 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 a better uh, a ventilatory exchange so there's there's some really interesting stuff that's come out in the last year there's some randomized control trials that have come out on rapid sequence intubation on pediatrics um, I know that there are some trials underway in obstetrics, there's further trials in paediatrics and in adults, uh, so we're, we're building up a portfolio of information from which we, we can guide it where, where, where we are. You mentioned the stridulous patient or the patient with airway obstruction. Do you recommend any changes to the airway examination that we should be performing if we're planning on using Thrive as part of an anaesthetic technique? So that's a, it's a very important point and I, 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 I think um, with the enthusiasm for Thrive, uh, I would hate for anyone to, to, to misinterpret that and to think that that in any way changes anything that we do as anaesthetists. So every single thing that we were doing before uh, the, the technique was used should still be done. So actually, we, of course, we still have to go and see a patient. We still have to undertake an airway examination. We still have to consider what the issues are. We still have to have a plan A, a plan B, a plan C. We still have to recognize that uh, although the technique and high, high flow nasal oxygen and Thrive is going to add something to our practice, it's not a substitute for everything else that we do. And it will fail and can fail, and we have to have all of the um, techniques that we were using previously in place so that on the occasional times when it does not work or it fails, the technique fails, then we have to be able to do what we were doing before. So it's by no means a substitute for anything else. It is just an addition to what we do at the moment. 
the uh, Airway SIG meeting talked about some of the guidelines internationally for managing the difficult airway. How does Thrive fit into international airway management guidelines? There's um, a number of um, national guidelines that mention uh, nasal oxygenation. So the, in the difficult, the difficult Airway Society in the UK um, mentions nasal oxygenation in the 2015 unanticipated management of the unanticipated difficult airway. Um, the obstetric guidelines from 2015 from the Difficult Airway Society mention it. Um, the All India Difficult Airway uh, uh, guidelines which came out last year, they mention it as well. So I think there is a recognition that um, whilst it's, as I said, not a substitute for everything else we do, it may just add some benefit and it and, and it will add some extra time in case there are problems. So uh, so I, I think that's that has been incorporated and I suspect it will be incorporated into future guidelines as well. With the obese patients, which clearly we're seeing more and more of, uh, particularly in uh, where I work or in many of the other hospitals, how does Thrive alter in the conditions we see with extreme obesity? So obesity is really interesting. So the, we've we, we've got a pretty good picture now of, of where the technique seems to work. Uh, so it, 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 in our hands and in other uh, units, it, it provides uh, significantly extended apnea times and uh, oxygenation in difficult airways. It's, it's adding benefit into the paediatric population. Um, we'll have to wait and see about other population groups, as the, as, particularly as the randomized controlled trials come out. For the obese patient, we found that sort of moderate obesity it adds a significant benefit to. So the apnea time is, is significantly enhanced. But at the at the extremes, at the super morbid obesity levels, the apnea time is uh, is 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 nowhere near as long as you'd expect in a in a in a slim patient. But it's still greater than comparable techniques. Um, so I think it's still adding something. But um, if if you're if you're expecting uh, half an hour of an apnea time in a super morbid obese patient. I think that's completely unrealistic, uh, and I think it's 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 a number of minutes, certainly not 20, 30 minutes. Uh, so that's um, that's that's a limit. So you could argue that that's a uh, uh, it has a limit at super morbid obesity. It may well have a limit at the other extreme end of the spectrum, which is the very 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 small babies, and um, we'll we'll have to see whether that's that's true or not. But y you could one one could imagine that because of neonatal physiology and, and, all, the, and all the differences, they're, they're also at risk of, of, perhaps not at risk, but they're also, um, uh, the technique may be limited in that group as well. So they're, they're at, at both ends of the spectrum, at, at a kind of neonatal level, the technique may not work anywhere near as efficiently as it does in most of the middle group. And at the extreme end of the spectrum with super morbid obesity, we know that it, that it, it doesn't work as well, uh, but it works we think better than comparable apneic oxygenation techniques. Um, probably at those, at those extreme ends of the spectrum, one needs something like uh, BiPAP or you know, significant biphasic pressure uh, that, that really recruits and really keeps things open uh, in the lungs that, that, and, and that may be effective at that sort of level. Well, thank you very much for your time today and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great.